welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the Pokemon-inspired Kreitcher's role-playing game, which we'll be getting into tonight, the one and only Dice Bag. How you doing tonight, man? Hey, I'm doing all right. Mm -hmm. I'm good, good to hear. Glad to be here. Good to hear, good to hear. So... <sighs> A tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, for me it was um, probably Baldur's Gate, the first one, mm -hmm. when I was a wee lad. Uh, that was when I first had my experience with D&D, &D and... Uh, Going through the rule books, I loved really reading the um, the uh, manuals and stuff that they brought in with um, old video games. And shame that they don't have that anymore. But a lot of the actual D and D rules were put in there, and I kind of reverse engineered it a bit without having source books and just played around with that. Now, when uh, Baldur's Gate Two came out, that Thing. That book was thick. It was basically a source book on its own, so that was nice. Mm -hmm. And I've there's been there's been some interesting case, cases of manual. I think personally, I think I think that there was a missed opportunity to treat a game manual like a choose your own adventure book. Oh, you know, j just that. Especially, if, especially if it, if that kind of thing was done for something like, say, um, Lone Wolf, you know, just as an in joke. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, the just the just the idea of of having a game within the manual for the game is uh, okay. a, bit, a bit of a opportunity lost. Hell, I, I just read them for the mechanics. I'm into that. <laughs> uh, I do. I do remember that the, the VHS for the for the for the Street Fighter Alpha movie. I I, I think it was I think it was either Alpha or Two. Um, had a voucher for the Street Fighter RPG that World of Darkness had put out. Hmm. I didn't know they made a Street Fighter RPG. Yeah, not only not only was it made, it still has a very loyal fo following in Brazil. Really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but were you were were you largely a one system lifer, or did you jump around between systems over the years after starting out with Baldur's Gate? Well, I've never really had a very solid group to play RPGs with. So it's mostly just me trying to get my friends to play the latest edition of D&D. &D. That's been my, most of my experience, but I have kind of uh, looked into other systems just because I really like the game design aspect of it. So I've obviously uh, took a gander at World of Darkness, as you can probably tell by the mechanics I use in creatures. But, uh, oh, by the way, uh, yeah, the game the game I'm making is pronounced just creatures, mm -hmm. not crit, not creatures. It's just a portmanteau of crystal creatures. So that's as that's how I got it going. All, all right, <laughs> my bad. Well, everybody makes that mistake. Everybody pronounces it weird, but it's more normal than you realize. <laughs> well, I th I think I think it's the why part that throws people off. Definitely, but. And, you know, nobody really hears it pronounced, as is the case with a lot of Pokemon, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I went for a long time pronouncing Charizard as Charizard. Yeah, though I get, though I suppose, I suppose the, I suppose what um, determines that is the, is 
whether or not people will watch the anime or not. Yeah, that too. Oh. But with the with that said, obviously obviously I couldn't help but notice that um Creatures is using a D is using a D ten based die pool. Um, yeah. Now, when before we went live, we, you had mentioned World of Darkness. Was there a particular entry in the World of Darkness line that was kind of your gateway that served an influence? I've never actually played World of Darkness on the tabletop. I've just read a lot of the books, and I have played uh, the Vampire the Masquerade the PC game. Which one? Uh, I think it's Bloodlines. Yeah, that's... Is that the one the one where you're walking around in the modern day and yeah? Uh... Yeah, that's the that's Man. the one. I just I just had to bring that up because there were two games. <laughs> yeah, there's like one set in an older time period, isn't there? It tries to go past and present, and that was Redemption. Hmm. Uh, it's not as well remembered, most mostly because it's a bit more <laughs> linear. Hmm. Then again, yeah, Bloodlines was heavy on the role play side of it. Mm -hmm. It was j it was jank. It's st it still kind of is because that <laughs> studio hadn't done hadn't done that that kind of um, that kind of setup when it came to using a full on engine. But it's but that's the one that is beloved, and I I'd, I'd like to say I'm looking forward to Bloodlines too. Except I don't except. I have my doubts if that'll even come out with all the stuff that's happened with it. A follow-up to a well-liked old game in the year 2024. The odds are against you, I think. Mm. Not as much as one might not as much as one might think. It's just that the big stinkers create that much of a stink. You know, everybody remembers the stripper. Hmm. Uh, a lot of indie studios are doing good stuff these days. Mm -hmm. But with with since so with Kreich, so with um creatures, <laughs> I'll get I'll get I'll get into the habit of it. I promise. Oh, um, it, it's the easiest pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> obviously, that obviously that's taking a lot of cues from Pokemon. Yeah. And I think one of the big one of the big things to ask was did you is what gen did you break into did you break into Pokemon with? Were was it Gen 1? Was it one of the later gens? Was it It's Gen ones? 1. I was ah. playing Gen 1 on an emulator back in the day. <laughs> and developing a and developing a shared hatred of Zubats, I'm guessing. Zubats are so ugly and annoying. <laughs> I have much cuter bats in mine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just Z every ga every game has that one enemy t enemy type that is my whipping boy. You know, in, mm. in Castlevania, it's Medusa heads. In <laughs> in in um po in in some Final Fantasies, it's Marlboros. In po in Pokemon, it's Zubats. Except for one gen where they didn't show up in every cave. Yeah, and Pokemon has the cave problem also, where they're just a pain to traverse because they're constantly subject to random encounters all the time. They're they're the games they're the games equivalent of sewers in other games. Mm hmm. Uh, two. There's two types of levels that no that nobody enjoys. Um, sewer levels and any and any level with water or ice physics. <laughs> I know. That, yeah, pretty I know much. That, I know that Miyamoto said that the water temple in Ocarina of Time was a, was a mistake, but too little, too late. <laughs> but from what from what I'm from what I'm seeing, it it's looking. Am I correct in saying that your that the approach that you're taking is not doing the whole thing of having the um, creatures do, doing the bulk of the fighting, but that the player char the player character the um trainer if you will is just as much of a participant 
Yeah, for the most part. I actually intended to go the full-on Pokemon route where it was just the creatures fighting, but after a few sessions of testing that out, I came to the realization it's just really freaking boring for the players when their turn comes up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, wasn't long after that that I statted out some basic weapons and started playing with that. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's increased the amount of stuff I have to do for like exponentially, but uh, I think it's worth it. A little bit of pain, so a, a little bit of pain now instead of a bigger pain later. Uh, and it's also just, uh, it makes more sense, you know. Mm -hmm. One of the things you have to worry about with the tabletop RPGs is that, like, when you're outside of the mechanics-heavy combat situation type of stuff, yet the the world building is your rule book, basically. Yep. And... As I, understand, as I understand it, one of the big reasons for the um, portmanteau of crystal creatures is that crystals are utilized as the equivalent of a Pokeball. That's what's used to cap to capture and bind creatures. Right. That's We want to keep everything in more, a pretty fantastical realm, so mm -hmm. no balls, just crystals. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I've been very... Um, adamant about is making things very fantastical as opposed to the uh the kind of modernized semi sci-fi futuristic world that pokemon is which is weird because you usually don't think of it that way but that is what it is yeah i i like to refer i like to refer to it as a um gestalt setup since genre classifications when it comes to popular media in a lot of parts of East Asia aren't as set in stone as it might be in the West. That's some, that's something I've learned just from experience. It, I'm not sure if it's like not set in stone or if it's just different from what we're used to, but there's definitely some uh, differences on how they're used. And also, they do a lot of things with um, like stuff like um, Western fantasy style stuff is very different looking when it comes to the, the way the Asian creators do things. So it's pretty much its own kind of set of things. Mm. It's complicated, I'll put, I'll put it that way. <laughs> but given... Now, when when I look at the when I look at character creation of creating the conjurer, which is basically the equivalent of a train of a trainer, mm. um, there there's of course there's of course the there's of course the whole thing of setting up the um, talents, which I'd say is your equivalent to uh, to the um, core attributes, right? Um, then of then of course um, skill. I actually I actually like the fact that you have um, set skill levels instead of um, a set of skill points and just throwing that at the players. But when it comes right. to when it comes to spending um, your starting experience in in order to get abilities, prof professions, and the like, um, where do you where do you draw the line between the benefits of abilities versus the benefits of professions? Well, you know, I, I'm still kind of working on professions, so it's all kind of up in the air right now. I still need to do a lot of playtesting, but the professions are mostly for crafting and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to make customized equipment and whatnot from that, so that'll presumably increase your power level, but not everything is kind of a one-to-one -one increase in character power. If you look at the abilities, some of those are very social-focused and all that. Mm -hmm. And obviously, some people are going to be more heavily involved in the um, 
the combat side of things than others, but everyone's going to have creatures that are going to do probably the bulk of the fighting, so mm-hmm. as long as you invest in that, you should be up to par. Yep. And with the, with that in with that in mind, in in when it comes to um or when it comes to organizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is I remember I remember trying to trying to look up trying to look that up on the World An- Anvil. I'm guessing the organization I- idea is something that's still in the work in the works. It's is, a fairly new thing. Is it a, is it a case where you're joining a faction and you get certain benefits but certain obligations? Yeah, basically. Mm-hmm. It's a way for you to give role playing hooks to players and they get a little something in return. Yeah. A bun- a bunch of factions, that's a very world of darkness thing to do. <laughs> now, you look at ev- look at everything White Wolf did and there's some sort of faction system even if it's not, even if it's not an outright mechanic. Yeah. Well, like I say, when you're outside the combat field, uh the world building is the rule book. So that's part of that philosophy there. Yeah. But it also gives the implication that your starting creature is going to be determined by your choice of organization. And since it's all about since it talks about meeting the requirements, would the requirements entail minimums when it comes to when it comes to ta- when it comes to talents, sk- skills and abilities? I think it mostly revolves around skills. Like each one is kind of a different thing. Mm. Let's see. Like not all of them are really kind of interchangeable on the same level. Mm. Like with the militia, for example, the root run militia. This is like the most basic one. Pretty much anybody can be a part of this. And it's kind of assumed that everybody is a part of it, but not in an active role. Like if you're hang- if you're living in this place, the root run area, then if something happens, you're going to be called on as a conjurer to do battle yep. because you're the one most fit. Mm-hmm. But if you're an actual active member, then yeah, that's going to be a little bit of a different thing. You're going to be actively taking work from them. And then whereas with like, let's say the Viridian Order. Now they're not they're more choosy but they don't have like specific game mechanic requirements. Mm-hmm. You know, they see you must be a conjurer and you must swear and uphold the Viridian oath and you have to successfully hatch a egg for their uh, agent creature. Mm-hmm. So that's mostly role playing stuff and then uh the third major one I would say is probably the League of Magi which specifically calls out that you need to have a certain level of skills that are kind of related to their area of expertise. Mm-hmm. And of course, all of those factions are effectively co-op. They're not really working against one each other. They're just kind of different focuses for your character. It isn't going to be one of those cases where if somebody's in a certain faction, you ha- you have to pick a fight with them. Not likely, but there are some um there are some like team rocket types. <laughs> mm-hmm. Specifically like what I've got on the wiki there, the artisans and the Clomont clans are kind of the antagonists of the of the setting as far as I've gotten right now. Mm-hmm. Of course, all this stuff I'm talking about right here, I kind of expect people to adapt things to their own uh play style in their own setting. It's made to be very modular. Mm-hmm. So people can kind of pick and choose which elements they want. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately that's usually how people play these types of games anyways. Yeah. Now with with that with that said, when it comes to the when it, when it comes to I also I also couldn't help but note that you have two you have two primary resources for for both players and for creatures. Mm-hmm. 
And the, that be... Well, look, not, not so much when it comes to creatures. They don't have all three, but um, the introduction of, of both mana and stamina. So right. what I'm curious about is... Is 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 mana mainly used as a as a as a means to fun, as a means to funnel um, action possibilities to creatures, or are there some builds that are going to be using mana um, directly? Oh, there's definitely going to be builds using mana more directly, but it's also just kind of used as a resource for general um, mental stamina, you might say. And resource management is going to be kind of a big thing. So one of the things I encourage in the um, way you build your um, your skill challenges and stuff is to not like make them entirely pass or fail, but rather if they fail a check, it inflicts like a penalty or a drain on their resources, either from them, you know, just having to try over and over or something like that, or it'll inflict what I call an injury, which is a very um, abstract way of just saying you've you've uh, taken a penalty to one of your base stats, mm -hmm. your talents. And of course, injuries, if they stack up enough, that's when your character is in danger of actually dying. Yeah. Obvi obviously. And with that, with that in mind, the other the other thing I I couldn't help but notice is the way you handle um, criticals. Now, mm -hmm. give, given the, given that this is D10 based and it seems to be based more on um, successes than on totals, which is fairly standard for for this sort for this sort of approach. Um, in order for an attack to be con to be considered a crit, all that would be needed is not for a certain number of die to, to hit 10, but just that one of them does. Yeah, and you can crit multiple times in with a single attack, let's say. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of ex w done with the expectation that like each die that you roll represents an attempt to deal damage. Yeah. So when you roll a 10, that's like a double hit. And that's sometimes they trigger extra abil extra features of the the attacks you're using. So crits aren't like super powerful or anything. They're they're just a slight boost. But they do count as like an automatic success. Mm -hmm. And when it and I'm guess I'm guessing that unlike unlike the unlike a lot of World of Darkness affairs, you're not having people roll to see whether or not that damage actually counts. Uh, nah, that that doesn't seem like a a helpful mechanic to me. Mm -hmm. The damage you you deal is the damage you deal, mm -hmm. and if there's any kind of like defenses or anything, that's pretty much tied directly to the roll itself. So if your opponent has some kind of effect that's uh, makes them tougher, that's going to increase the difficulty of your roll. Yeah rather than reduce any kind of damage you're, that's incoming. Because ultimately, it's kind of the same thing. So is, the, less you, the less you hit, the less damage you'll deal. Yeah. When it, comes to when it comes to defending, is that a passive or an active thing? That's pretty much all passive. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's trying to hit you, they're, tr they're trying to get a number of hits over your, say, evasion... Uh, yeah, basically uh, every die that you roll has a chance to inflict damage. Mm -hmm. So any anything that hit, hits or exceeds the evasion is going to deal the amount of damage that's listed. And then that just stacks up over the battle. Mm -hmm. Now, when I, when I looked into the creature codex... Obvious, obviously, some of the things were were pretty straightforward. Whether it be resistances and weaknesses, whether it, whether it be the type, whether it be types, uh, but when it comes to classes, what does that what does that entail? Like the first one, fluid global, 
as the classes fluid, ooze, and pressurized. Right. Classes I've been doing a lot of work on, actually. Those are basically the equivalent of like a move set for uh, say pokemon so those define their combat abilities and the stats they gain leveling up and other than that their advancement functions basically the same way that skills would for your character so you'll just buy levels one by one mm -hmm. and then they'll get the bonuses listed in each of the class level descriptions and we've got it set up so like each odd um, each odd level gives them a new power to use and then the even levels give them as just a static bonus. Yeah. So it so it's a, is it a case where there, where um creatures are going to be leveling up more linearly than say um, conjurers? Yeah, pretty much. There's kind of less room for a variation between each of the creatures. Mm -hmm. And that was something I specifically chose because there's going to be so many creatures and you're going to be dealing with multiple ones as with your conjurer. So I wanted to keep them fairly simple. Yeah. And in the spirit of that, are you go are given Given the inspirations, are you going to be doing a rule of six as far as how many creatures you can bring with you, or is it I'd as many as you, as many as you can hold in crystals? <laughs> uh, it's it's not going to be a rule of six. There's going to be like a rule of four, kind of. Like I've had to kind of rework a big part of like a magic system that I rigged up in order to kind of justify all this, but basically you have an ability that you'll be able to pick up. You'll start out being able to, let's see, attune one of your creatures at a time, and that's the one that you can like directly control. And then as you, uh, let's see, as you put more points into, let's see, what is it? The capacity ability. Then you'll be able to attune additional creatures, and that goes up to four at the maximum. Because I feel like six is just way too much for a game like this, where you're, where you have to track everything yourself. I have to worry about streamlining things and making the actual play experience It'd not also a pain in the rear. Too much, too much for the GM because <laughs> you can six managing six and th and then more. That's perfectly fine when there's only one player to to really account for in in the video games, but obviously mm -hmm. in a tabletop you're not. Um, I'm not going to say nobody's going to play the, it as a duet, but they're going to be in the minority. Oh yeah, and uh, you don't have the computer to do all the work for you, obviously. No, you just have ex you just have extra extra work, and as we yeah. as I talked about before we went live. Um, one little change can um, sp can snowball down the hill. You know, you know the snow snowball at the top of the hill. You roll it down, then it gets bigger and bigger. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I've been working on this game for so long. Is just there's so many things that need to be tweaked from the way Pokemon is that it's basically taken on its own thing. Well, you sure as hell don't want one. T <laughs> don't want one type. Um, dominating over everything else. Isn't that right, psychic types? What a terrible <laughs> idea it would be to have one type be so be so overpowered that they're basically a game winner, right? <laughs> no, I'm not I've, salty at all. <laughs> I've tried to balance the types, but I make no promises there yet. <laughs> no, I'd, I've got I'm just... I've got like a whole uh, a spreadsheet for that that tracks how many of each type are strong and weak against other things and so far every every um every type is like within two um places of each other so the ones with the most advantages are just two away from the ones with the most the least advantages 
I think that's about as close as you're going to get without coming up with wacky combinations where, like, uh, I don't know, the air type is good against uh, poison for some reason. Yeah, but I'm... Unless I'm mistaken, I didn't see a... Uh, no, a normal type. <laughs> there is no normal type. There is a beast type, which is kind of the replacement. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've got a deliberate philosophy for those that makes them not so that they're not just like regular animals. Which definitely makes definitely makes sense. It's just. The idea of normal types that can lead can lead to some in, can lead to some interesting res, some interesting results because the idea of normal is so broad. Yeah, and it's also kind of a question of the world building. Like, are these just normal animals? What are they? What's going on? Plus, I might be a little biased because because when when I think of normal types, I end up thinking of um, Whitney from Gen Two. Oh yeah, you you don't like the mill tank? No. <laughs> I mean, if you know if you know that she, I consider I consider her one of the biggest examples of a difficulty spike. And yes, if you know she's coming, she's not that difficult to deal with. But the thing about a difficulty spike is that it isn't is that no knowing in advance does doesn't mean a damn thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, but if but the other thing that I could I couldn't help but notice is that there is there isn't the equivalent of that line between um, attack and special attack. <laughs> uh, there kind of is. We have uh, strength and power mm -hmm. with deflection and evasion. Okay. Those kind of fill the same role. Mm -hmm. There's a little blur between them. Sometimes you'll have strength things that attack evasion, but mm -hmm. those are the outliers. Yeah. And then, of course, they usually key off of stamina and mana as their resource, respectively. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there's not going to be all that many... Um, ev evolution um trees just y just yet but i but i do recall i do recall in the in the original games you there were advantages and disadvantages to evolution uh, namely that you'd you would certainly get stat bo bonuses from evolving but there were certain moves that you would that if you if you go with a more if you go with a lower tier you'd get a lot earlier so, mm -hmm. what would be the what what would be the advantages or disadvantages when it comes to evolving, or is it a case where it hap where it's going to happen regardless? Uh, it's pretty much all upside. The only thing is, you have to meet the requirements, mm -hmm. and part of that is your affinity level with the creature, which is something you'll kind of have to deal with in role playing. So you actually have to, you know, engage with the creature on a role playing level. Also, I'm lo I'm looking at some of the classes that you that you have. Is is the class system ca kind of a way to um, give a bit give a give a bit of control? Because it looks like as you it looks like they're essentially um, tracks that you can gain the po the um, powers, i.e., moves for a, for a given creature. Right, they're they're pretty linear. Like once you go through one, you can go through another, or you can mix and match as you see fit. Yeah. Ultimately, once you max out all your classes, then that's your creature and its highest power. Yeah. Oh. And it's pretty much always going to end up in the same place. But I am thinking that I'll probably have to impl Im um, impose some kind of limit on the amount of powers you can have equipped at a single time just for the sake of like efficiency and managing things especially especially since you don't want the wizard problem where somebody's got a, a hundred different powers yeah <laughs> but 
the main reason I hi I highlight that kind of thing is I'm I'm guessing that's how you would build a power repertoire instead of making a linear power repertoire for each individual creature. Yeah, like I I mentioned this earlier, but I'm trying to get really modular with everything. So everything kind of references everything else. So the classes are each a modular piece and then the creatures themselves are made up of classes and combined with types and stats and each thing is kind of taken as its own mm -hmm. which in a roundabout way is also a good way to future proof like if down oh, yeah. somebody wants to either some somebody else or even you wants to make additional creatures you have a fr you have a framework with the classes to at least start yeah and also makes a homebrew easier yeah as opposed, as opposed, which is something I've been an advocate for when it comes when it comes to design. I mean, yeah, homebrew is inevitable, and and I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but at the very least, I think some designers could do with get with um, giving people some framework, giving people some framework instead of throwing them into the pool and saying swim. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. That's one of the reasons why I kind of liked fourth edition D and D, like we were talking about before, is that it was very uh modular and standardized and i think it could have gone more that way and it did kind of go that direction when it went in the essentials versions and put those out but I wasn't, that was a little too little too late that. um <laughs> essentials essentials was oh, essentials was not only overcorrection but a bit of canary in the coal mine regarding the mindset of just trying to just trying to overcorrect for the quote unquote sins of um of four E, mm -hmm. I do th I do think that Thirteenth um, Age did a did a decent job when it came to carrying on that modularity. Um, I haven't checked that one out. I'll have to take a look at it. Especially especially with the especially with the use of starting talents, the the use of icons instead of um, alignment, as well as. Um, how it ha how it handled its three tier approach. Oh, there's been there's been a few others that have ca that have carried that onward. the the key th the key thing is. I remember I remember at one point trying to house rule a cl a class design in five um, e and trying to see if there was any sort of framework I could utilize, and there and there really isn't. The best that yeah. people said, the best that people gave me is just, is just go is just go with it, <laughs> which <laughs> tells me enough to tell me nothing. Um, mm -hmm. I guess Co and I guess Cobalt Press um, was paying attention to that little issue because, from what I've seen with Tales of the Valiant, they are de that they are definitely not falling into that trap. So that just as an exa as an example, and I'm, I'm not going to dive too much into it. Every class gets their subclass at third level, period. Some mm. class, some classes get new features at fir at first level to fill in the gap, but there are but there are certain th type of themed features that you that every class gets at certain levels, as opposed yeah. to some classes getting it at first, second, or or third. Right, that's something I tried to avoid. And when I look at like the initial fourth edition classes, I definitely see the same hints of like the Pokemon um, move list level by level. And it's like, okay, this is just too much. You can simplify this and not make it so uh, specific to each instance. Yeah, which is why I bring up 13th Age, because it did um, simplify things. And gr granted, granted, some of that is by, is by not having thirty levels for e for each. But <laughs> the the other th the the other um, thing that I couldn't I couldn't help but notice is when it comes to the different types of essences that you can get through loot when taking on other creatures, or or likely just find while ad while adventuring. I'm guess and I'm guessing essence is key to both. Um, evolutions as well as crafting. 
Yeah, that's basically your crafting materials for the most part. And that's something that I kind of worked into the world building again. Mm -hmm. There's some of these uh, like mechanics that I've kind of had to rejigger so the way some things you would expect to work actually work. Mm -hmm. And for things like Essence, that's basically I've made the uh, executive decision as the god of the world that uh, creatures are unstable mutant animals, so... When they actually die, their bodies decompose rapidly, and you know what's left over is the essence. Yeah, and given that you're dealing with conjurers and a, and a lot of well, ma well, magic in the setting that you've made, that certainly makes sense. Um, mm. And it's also a it also answers a annoying question about Pokemon, which is. After you knock the Pokemon out, why can't you just throw the ball then? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be the, the reasonable thing to do instead of trying to get it down to a sliver of health and then throwing it. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of that, when I, look at the, when I look at the character sheets for the Conjurers, I do see that Binding Crystals appear to be in a tier because you have the lesser version as an, as an example. And is, right. is it a case where th where there's a certain there's a certain type of th of um, threshold or a certain type of tier that each type of binding crystal can can be utilized for? I think the main thing I'm going to use to differentiate them is just the uh, the threshold of health that they can have to for a successful binding. Mm -hmm. So, like with the lesser binding crystals, they their uh, threshold advances by five health per hit or success on your binding roll. So once you get into like the uh, standard binding crystal, it'll probably be like a seven per hit thing and so on from there. And then of course there's ways I'm looking at at making more like uh, the specialty Pokeball versions of those where they may be more effective against certain types and stuff. But there's a lot of design space for that, so I haven't explored nearly all of it yet. Mm -hmm. I so I'm get I'm guessing it's a I'm guessing it's a case where you'd you'd um use it you'd make you'd make the you'd make the roll if the to if the total HP value of that roll is um is higher than what their current health is, then it's a successful capture. Right, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. And if if not, which does bring the other question: If it doesn't work, do you just permanently lose that crystal? Yes. All right. <laughs> at the very and they the are very least they are more sense here. <laughs> right, they are fairly expensive, mm -hmm. and part of the uh, binding process, as I uh, would describe it, has the crystal actually shatter and then try to enclose the creature in the shards. Mm -hmm. And I've got a piece of art showing that. That's one of, one of them that I really wanted to uh, get done early on. Which is understandable, because when you're dealing with a very specific type of world, it's important mm -hmm. to, to, have, to have it nailed down as far as, what you, as, far as how these kind of things are going to look. Um, not too long ago, one of one of my co-hosts and I were covering a game called Brass and Steel. That is a good game, but it should have had some more art th to really nail down the the look of certain things, like the dreaming, which is supposed mm -hmm. to be this this um dreamscape slash slash internet. That's basically a way for them to use hacking mechanics in a steampunk world. <laughs> but you know, there's that's a perfect given that that. A lot of the mechanics within that talk about um, in introduce introducing and de and dealing with figments, or ju or just the impression of something as opposed to reality. It's one of those things that's be that's best to show instead of just describing in text. Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm big on. And like with the binding process, that's definitely something I would have trouble describing the full, uh, the full, like, 
I don't even know how to use the word for it, but you know, show it what what it actually w- looks like and how it functions. And since there, I don't know of anything, another example of like this kind of process mm. in other works of fiction, I'm not really familiar with it. So I just, I had to put it on paper <laughs> or on screen rather, mm. since I, it's digital. But yeah, speaking of uh, dreamscapes, that's another thing I need to work on because uh, that's something that is big in creatures, but I haven't really done a whole lot with, especially in the artwork. So that's mm-hmm. definitely something I need to focus on soon. Yeah. Would it since essence since essences are part of evolution? Would you say that those would be the equivalent of using the element stones to ev- to evolve certain Pokemon in the in the um, game series? Uh, kind of. It's it's more like just something they uh, consume, mm-hmm. but. I am wondering like exactly how I'm going to do that kind of evolution stone thing because I do have some um I do have some creatures that have like branching metamorphosis mm-hmm. which I would like to have something along those lines but I'm not sure if it's going to be a worthwhile thing to replace the essence system with yeah Now with the core die roll we we talked about it being D, about it being D10 and being hit based, but there's obviously a lot a lot of emphasis on the thre- on modifying the threshold of how of how high the die is to get in order to be counted as counted as a hit. Um, mm-hmm. But given that, what would you say the baseline difficulty is? You know, in terms of what number a D10 needs to roll over in order to be considered a hit. I'd say you usually want to start at like a six. So six or sixes and sixes or higher are considered hits, and tens are considered two hits. Right, but uh, that's for like the easiest level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the situation where you you'd just be rolling one success is a success for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Which make which makes sense. Oh. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of those it's one of those things where it's important where it's important to have a baseline like how in a lot of D twenty based games the baseline is usually fifteen for mm-hmm. for the overall difficulty and in in this case I don't th- I don't think I would it be fair of me to say that for mo for most skill rolls outside of combat um, as long as one die is considered a hit then the roll is a success. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> I I don't really have a very specific way of dealing with that. I'm very free form in those terms. Like a lot, I don't know if I have this whole thing written up on the wiki, but I've got like a guideline for it mm-hmm. in some of my Google Docs that I've been keeping track of. And um, one of the things I deal with is the uh, difficulty and complexity. So difficulty is obviously the number you need to hit with the dice, but then complexity is the number of times you need to hit with the dice. Yeah. And that can vary a lot depending on what type of thing you're doing. So like I said before, I'm not a big fan of just making everything like a single pass or fail roll, but if, say, you have a complexity of three and you only hit two successes... Uh, maybe you succeed, but you, uh, I don't know, you slip and take some damage if you're trying to climb something, or you t- suffer an injury or something like that, or it just, you need to spend time and maybe you lose a, some stamina for it. You know, it's something to kind of punish you, but not kill you or block you from advancing. Yeah. Oh, and I did. What the a big re, a big reason why why I was curious about that in addition is the fact that you have both roll and dice modifiers. Right. It looks like roll roll modifiers just just mess with the number rolled on all on the whole set that's rolled, and di, and dice modifier just adds more di, just adds or removes more dice. 
Right. Which, given that, is there is there an upper threshold in terms of how many die you can you can roll in a given action? I haven't set one. No. Yeah, I remember. I remember some of the roll and keep games had had it that if that um no matter what you can't roll more than ten any any more than that and there would be a static modifier applied for every die above ten you would have rolled. But that that's just one possibility. That sounds less fun, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, not not every in in. In all in all fairness, roll and keep is some based, so I can see why it's done there. Uh, that you makes roll, sense. You roll X number of d10s. You keep the, you keep Y high. You keep Y highest. Add those together. That's what you get. Tens explode, and mm -hmm. they keep exploding if you keep rolling tens. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of this from just the the um, math I typically have going is that. Um, See, if you're rolling 10 dice, that's 10 opportunities to deal damage. Uh, the standard damage is like 3 damage per hit. So that caps out at like, what, 30 damage? Mm -hmm. And on the high end, you're, like the high end hit points creatures are probably going to be pushing like 70 or so. And they're probably going to have fairly high defenses, so those aren't likely to uh, all hit anyways. So, uh, as far as I, I'm concerned, if you can get more than 10 die, go right ahead. Good for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Though oh. dice, die modifiers are usually fairly rare. So, it'd, it'd be um, roll modifiers that are more common? Yeah, that's probably the thing you're going to be dealing with most of the time. Right, that, ma that makes sense. But... With now, with that in with that in mind, I know that there's the playtest version that's currently out out there. But do you have do you have plans on putting like a quick start ver like a um, quick start version outside of that mailing list um, down the road, or is it mostly just refining the world anvil as you've got it set up right now? Oof. Uh, I'd like to get a quick start, but I'm not really sure where to go with it. Like, uh, you know, I'm going to, in the near future, get some uh, kind of training sessions going for people that want to give the game a try and stream those. Mm -hmm. I just have to kind of get things together and ready to run. And um, I'm setting up a gilded server for that, for people who want to get involved on, in actual playing and playtesting. So, uh, you know, that's probably going to be the direction I'd go with getting people into the game. More so than like a really watered down version, because I'm not even sure how I would water the rules down to an extent that you can just pick it up and play it off the off a shelf or something. Mm -hmm. I can I can get that. Well, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. <laughs> and it was pretty tame madness. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be more th where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>